Good afternoon, uh, everyone, and welcome to our uh, third Tanya ML meetup, UK meetup, uh, where today Dominic Bings, VP Technology from Audio Analytics, is going to talk about how to make ML work in the real world. So, in his presentation, Dominic is going to uh, share how difficult it is to make ML work in, in the real scenarios and also show possible uh, solutions to make ML work. Uh, in the real use cases. Okay, so before we start with Dominic's presentation, um, I'd like to do just a, a bit of housekeeping. So first of all, I'd like to uh, thank our um, TinyML talk sponsors. So ARM, DeepLight, Edge Impulse, Maxim Integrated, uh, Quixo, Reality AI, and SceneSense. Um, so, and um, another thing that we'd like to remind all of you is our next animal talk on, Tues on Tuesday, 2nd of March, where Ibn Upton, founder of the Raspberry Pi Foundation, uh, is going to talk about the inference with Raspberry Pi Pico. Uh, the webcast will start at 8 a.m. Pacific time. Okay, and um, we have also another big announcement uh, and is around the next TinyML Summit 2021. Unfortunately, this one will be virtual, but it's gonna be great anyway. So five days of presentations, over 50 presentations. Um, the, the event will be, uh, will start the 22nd of March and will end the 26th. Uh, it will be online, as I mentioned before, and most important, it's going to be completely free. Um, during the present, you're going to have quite a lot of presentations, but also tutorials, panel discussions, and also um, we're going to award the three best tiny ML uh, paper product or innovations. So for this reason, I uh, suggest you to register. Our line is going to take just a few more minutes, a few, a few minutes to register. Uh, in order to enjoy our next TinyML uh, summit, which is going to be pretty soon. Okay, concerning the TinyML, uh, this is an important slide for us because we started, I mean, not a long time ago, but we have seen a significant growth. And when I say grow, it means an exponential growth because we have seen, uh, we had 160 people in 2019 where we started, and we are expecting roughly 3,000 members or attendees for uh, the tiny ML, so which is a, a great number for, uh, for the tiny ML community. Um, and so this means that how important and how uh, important is the uh, machine learning on the tiny devices. Uh, so this table basically summarizes all our numbers, but that is basically uh, a translation of what the tiny ML means nowadays. So concerning the um, tiny ML summit, I'd like to also to give a big thank you to our sponsor because as I've said before, the tiny ML summit uh, 2021 is going to be free and we need to thank our sponsor to make it free. So ARM, Qualcomm, Samsung, uh, Eta Compute, uh, Latais and other big uh, companies which are listed here. So a big thank you to all of them which are, who are making uh, this event uh, free of charge. So we are approaching the beginning of the presentation where Tom, uh, Dominic is going to uh, present his, his talk behind the ML on real use cases, but I'd like to uh, also introduce the Tiny ML UK committee. That, so the team uh, behind the Tiny ML UK. So apart from me, so we have, I'm Gianmarco. I'm the um, tech lead for the uh, machine learning group at ARM. There is also Dominic, who is going to present today, uh, who is the VP Technology of Audio Analytics. And there is also Alessandro Grande, a developer advocate and ecosystem manager for ARM and Neil Cooper, so who is the VP Marketing for Audio Analytics. So thank you very much, all of you guys. I mean, it's, it's a great uh, that we managed also to have uh, our third um, tiny ML uh, talk. It's not easy, as we know, because we are all from, we're working from home. Um, 
but we are making our best to at, um, at least um, propose the interesting talks to all of you. And we really look forward to meeting you uh, face to face. So we are almost there. So Dominic Beings, uh, Dr. Dominic Beings was previously a staff engineer at Qualcomm working in a wide variety of different software roles prior to joining Audio Analytic. So at Qualcomm in Cambridge, he worked on MShop, a brief-based shopping application on and Vuforia, Qualcomm cross-platform augmented reality SDK. In addition, Dominic spent time in San Diego working on Qualcomm's core Android porting team with responsibility for the build and release team. Prior to Qualcomm, Dominic worked in a technical pre-sales at Savage Android's for, uh, forerunner. Before joining Savage, Dominic worked as a technical consultant at Scientific uh, Generic, now Sagentia, and prior to this, and prior to this, he worked on prepaid calling platform deployed to a number of mobile operators worldwide. Dominic's PhD investigated techniques for automating fault finding, debugging, and pieces of software. And today is here to um, talk about how to make ML work in the real world. So I'd like to welcome Dominic. Dominic, you can take the floor. Thanks, Gianmarco. Um, I should just point out that um, you don't have to be on the committee to be able to do a talk. So if anyone else has got talks they'd like to, to, to bring to the, to the group, we'd, we'd welcome the offers. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, making ML work in the real world. Um, just a little bit of background about audio analytic. Um, what we're interested in doing is uh, we're interested in giving machines a sense of hearing. Our um, mission is to give all machines a sense of hearing. Uh, and we're active across a range of sectors, including smartphones, hearables, smart speakers and smart home. And um, a little bit of history. We've been in, the, in, in this game for about 10 years, although tiny ML is a thing that's come sort of to the fore over the last few years, as, as we've seen. Um, in fact, we've been doing machine learning on, on microcontrollers for, for quite a long time, actually. Since I joined about eight years ago, we were already running on microcontrollers. So it's, it's not exactly new for us, but um, I think we've probably got some of the, the, the burns and the scars from the mistakes that we've made along the way. It's described by Bloomberg as a Shazam for real world sounds. It's, it's actually technically inaccurate. We don't use the same kinds of techniques, but it gives an idea and a flavor of, of what it is that we're trying to do. Machine learning in the real world is hard as those of us who've done any will probably know and those of us who haven't are probably wanting to understand why. Um, so, the, so the question is, why is it hard? And are there are things we can do to make it less hard. So here's a couple of stories about ML going wrong in the real world. Um, both concern Google. Um, it's, it sounds like I'm picking on Google, I'm not. It's more the opposite. If Google struggle with their level of experience and resources, those of us with less are hardly likely to be immune from the kinds of problems that they've seen. So the first one is uh, an MIT review report um, that describes Google's medical AI was really good in the lab, but the real world Oh, it didn't perform very well. And, and it took some time, I suspect, to understand exactly why that was. And then this is one of my favorite research papers I've ever seen. I've never seen a paper like it. So this is the list of authors. I've never seen a paper this long. And if you look down the list, you can see that an awful lot of them are Google people. Uh, they're all google.com email addresses. Um, and the paper describes how ML has gone wrong in, in various different uh, scenarios. There's actually six different use cases with detailed explanations of how this thing they've described as under-specification affected the performance of the models in the real world. So why is it that mere machine learning in the real world is hard? Well, there are differences. Um, uh, so as a, a software engineer, which is kind of my background, I'm not really a machine learning person. I'm, I'm here by sort of, um, I don't know, by mistake or something. Um, as software engineers, we're told we need to validate inputs. And, in, in, and if you've ever worked with a QA department, they reliably inform you where you've screwed it up, where you didn't get it right. The reality is that um, world, the real world um, is different often from what we expect. And the differences in the real world from the training set, and that was the underlying problem with the MIT review report. 
in ML, how do we actually validate the inputs? Um, so in, in the case of the ML, the uh, uh, medical uh, MIT report, uh, the, the issue was that, that uh, it was using smartphone cameras, but the quality of the camera between different smartphones was very different from those which have been tested in the, in the testing and training set. Um, another example might be something like um, improbable inputs with things like share prices rapidly changing in a way that, that was never seen in training or in test. And so the model doesn't have any guidance on what to do in that case. Um, sometimes the off inputs can be so off the scale that, that we didn't really even consider them. This is, this is an experience we had. In France, um, bird ownership is estimated at around 6.2 million homes containing a pet bird. And if you want to see how that compares, it's 8.3 million in the US. So there's obviously a very much higher percentage of homes with birds in France. And it turns out that in the south of France, there's a particular bird that sounds a lot like a US smoke alarm. Um, it's pretty unlikely evolution gave us this problem, but it is a problem and it's one we had to sort out. Um, so sometimes the inputs are just out of this world. You couldn't, couldn't think up these things. Um, Sometimes it's a combination. So if you think about something like a camera and you have leaves in a tree moving in the camera image, then maybe this was never considered in the training set for recognizing people coming to the door or something, but it's a real problem and it happens in the real world. We can't stop trees growing and probably don't want to stop trees growing. And, and oversimplification, uh, this is having a little bit of a go at Alexa, but you know, is, are you, when you name, name issue the name Alexa. Are you talking to the digital assistant or if you have a friend called Alexa, who you're talking to? It's, it's very difficult for the machine learning algorithms to figure this kind of stuff out. And essentially what it boils down to is they're all examples of how it's hard to specify fully the behavior we want in every second situation. We can't really predict every situation that we might encounter. Um, in our case, in audio, uh, you'd think it was relatively straightforward. Audio, after all, is, is pretty well pervasive across all sort of bits of um, hardware. It's not very difficult to add a microphone, but we have seen situations where the audio quality between different products um, that have microphones connected can be radically different. And even in some cases, in some products, it can be very significantly different even between different units. This is one reason why we typically ask for three different units to assess the audio quality of a given product. And if we see significant disagreement between those three, then we'll request even more units to go and refine our understanding of what the audio quality for that given device is. Measuring this kind of spread of quality is obviously domain dependent, but for us, it requires a good knowledge of audio signal processing. Obviously for other domains, you'll need different skills. A quote from the, uh, the Google paper says, we say that an ML pipeline is underspecified if there are many predictors F that the, pi the pipeline could return with similar predictive risk. What it's getting at is saying that if your ML pipeline can train many different models, but the evaluation stage is not able to identify which of these models will actually perform best in the real world, then you've got this underspecification problem. Uh, Sasha Kostovich, uh, director of research, who we'll come back to a little bit later, has often said in this company, uh, in the meetings we've had, that data is the oil on which the ML engine runs. But sometimes it, now, perhaps more than in the past, I, I, even that might be an understatement of the importance in data, uh, data in machine learning. And essentially, underspecification boils down to a data problem. You either have insufficient data, the wrong data, or bad data. Um, now, some of the things we can't do much about, some of the things we can do something about, we can't solve them all, but we can do some things about some of them. So we just need lots of data. So what could we do to mitigate against underspecification? Well, what we've found works quite well for us, uh, and I think it would work other well other, for, uh, in other domains, is to adopt the concept um, of something called a use case. If you're not familiar with use cases, essentially it's a way of, a very simple way of expressing what a product should do. Um, if you've done UML you, or that kind of thing, you, you'll know what a use case is. So thinking about use cases is a bit like mind mapping. Each decision you make 
about the use case influences elements of the pipeline and it influences other decisions you make. Um, and in particular, the use case will help to determine what acceptance means. Um, back when I worked in uh, telecoms, the last point that Jim and Co made about me working on prepaid systems, we used to deliver systems to these telcos and we had to produce a test specification called the acceptance tests, which they would run and if we passed them, they would then agree that the system did what it was supposed to do and they would then integrate it into their network and put it live. And if it failed, then they wouldn't. And in machine learning, the use case will help us to determine what those acceptance tests and metrics that we're gonna use are. So what we're actually trying to do is we're trying to build a product and a product is defined as how it's to be used. A product serves a function and it serves the function within certain boundaries. In this case, the spanner, I thought it was a great example because this is a 15 and 17 millimeter spanner. I'm not a mechanic, by the way, so please don't read anything into the fact it's a spanner, but it wouldn't work for a 22 millimeter nut and it wouldn't work for an eight millimeter nut. And, you know, it's not a hammer. It would, should do, so a product should do what is expected and it should not do what is not expected. So in this case, the spanner has an intended use. You can actually use it as a hammer if you must, but it doesn't really do the job. You'd be much better with a hammer. And the same is true of these virtual tools like ML systems. You can use general image recognition and a general rec image recognition model for working with x-rays, but the performance is just likely to be better if you train specifically using x-rays with x-ray data for doing x-ray analysis. And that's a bit unfortunate because that makes the data part harder. You can't just pick up data sets from here and there and use them to build these products. So thinking a bit more about the use case, if you wanted to implement people tagging in images, you will have one set of requirements for your product. It will need to do certain things, probably going to need to work quite quickly. Um, but if it gets stuff wrong, well, what's the cost of it getting something wrong? Compare that with, say, um, face unlock, where you don't really want it to be wrong. It'd be better to get someone to input a password or something if you can't be sure. So you would have a much different set of requirements. You might still have some speed requirements, but your handling of, of false positives would be different. Um, with sound recognition, there's a range of tasks that we can do. Um, just wanting to sort of set the context for the, 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 the sound part of what I'm talking about. So we have these concepts of sound event detection, acoustic scene recognition and tagging. So sound event detection is to report the occurrence of a specific sound that may be occurring. For example, and the one we're going to look at is a smoke alarm sound. Acoustic scene recognition is more about what the actual soundscape is and what's happening generally. So it's not any particular sound, um, but it can be used to um, help a product adapt to where it is. Most obvious case might be if you're inside or outside, um, well, how would you want things to be di different? How, if you are in a city where there's lots of noise and traffic and things, how would you want a product to behave more different, in, more helpfully for you in that environment? Uh, and the tagging, this, so this is sort of where you have a piece of media and you want to label the sounds that have occurred in the media somewhere. So, uh, let's take the case of the humble smoke alarm detector. Um, so what we're going to try and do is we're going to try and detect the sound of a smoke alarm. So I think most of us are familiar with what a smoke alarm sounds like um, and we know when we hear one. So the sound is pretty simple. It's beepy and repetitive. So this would suggest that it's relatively simple to train a model to detect. And the reality is it is relatively easy to train a model to detect the beepy sound. But unfortunately, that doesn't really make a smoke alarm detection product. And the reason is that we need to go right back to the very, very beginning of thinking about what it means to be a product. And this is where I come to the use case. What does it mean to detect a smoke alarm? What does it mean to have a correct detection? Where will it work? When will it work? What does it need, mean to work correctly? What's the budget for processing? What's the desirable latency? And who will use it and how will they interact with it? If you start to think through these things, you start to yield a, a wealth of information that start to bound a whole series of things you're going to do. Just thinking about the where will it work? So a smoke alarm detector is unlikely to need to work outside. So you don't need to consider 
in our case, what sounds might occur outside. So that's a, an element that you can eliminate. It does. It's helpful if you've got some outside sounds. We'll come back to that later. But that's one aspect that you can sort of remove from the picture. A one thing you don't need to deal with. So how could we go about building a smoke alarm detector? At this point, I've barely mentioned training, inference, and, and accuracy detection at all. Um, but we know some things. We know where the product will work. We know, or at least we think we know, or we may have taken an educated guess on what will please a user. We know where we're likely to be running, or we'll have restricted it to a subset. So we know some of the parameters of what model we need to build, but we need data. And also we need to know some things about the data we will need. So thinking a little bit more about a smoke alarm, uh, what does it need to do? Well, it needs to detect smoke alarm, the sound of smoke alarms, obviously. Uh, we've decided in this particular instance that it needs going to work in a normal, within normal home ranges and in within normal homes. Uh, and it's in situations with respect to walls and doors, etc. whatever that might mean. It needs to be accurate in that it should not detect a smoke alarm sounding if there isn't one sounding and should not often incorrectly classify a sound as a smoke alarm. And we'll come back to that. I'm going to work through at a very high level what we need to do to make a smoke alarm detector. The domain is obviously audio, but I believe that it should be naturally understandable to points raised and complexities in other tiny ML or indeed just general ML domains. So I need to talk a little bit about sound recognition as a machine learning task. And the reason is that um, it's perhaps, it, it, although we've been doing it for 10 years, it's still a relatively new domain for machine learning. It's much more closely related to wake words uh, than speech recognition, which may be obvious or it may not be. Um, and the reason is that for sound recognition tasks, there's often a lot of very uninteresting input that needs to be correctly rejected. So in this case, it's not just, it's a sound recognition task that we just, I described as sound event detection. So there's a lot of stuff we need to reject um, correctly because it's gonna hear an awful lot of stuff, which is never a smoke alarm. Um, because of this, and because of this approach, on-device operation is almost always required. We can't just stream this stuff off to the cloud. It almost always needs to be running on device, which is how we end up at TinyML, because it's got to run it in a small space. Um, and there's also no predictive model for how sounds will occur. For example, uh, with speech, you've got the concept of phone sequence of phonemes, which build words and words can follow certain patterns and they can't follow certain other patterns. But for example, in the work, in the case of sound, there's no, there's no rule that says if a smoke alarm sounds, a dog won't bark. It might do or it might not. There's, there's, no, there's no connection between those two things. So in the case of sound event detection and, and sound recognition more generally, um, we kind of have two parts to the model. Uh, which is similar to how speech works as well, which has an acoustic part and uh, a language part. But in sound, we have an acoustic part and a temporal part. And uh, so this little diagram shows uh, in the, uh, so essentially uh, here is uh, a frequency component. It's analyzing the frequency breakdown of what's happening. And this is the acoustic modeling part. And then here, it's looking over time and then you're analyzing what is happening over time. So uh, as we see, and it moves through time. So in, for a smoke alarm from this spectrogram, if you've not seen a spectrogram, essentially what we have is we have the frequency up the side, the colored bits, the bright colored bits indicate a signal or a, a presence of sound in that, in that frequency and time runs along the bottom. Uh, so it's, it's a tonal component, it has a tonal component somewhere between two and a half and three kilohertz. Um, each individual beat lasts a few hundred seconds and there appears to be a gap between them, which is looks similar. Uh, and they're grouped and they're grouped in threes in this particular example for this particular smoke alarm. And there's also a gap between these groups of threes, which seems to change. So we can sort of infer that. So we know kind of a little bit about the features we need to look for. Um, now we need to think a little bit more going back to that use case question of what does it mean fundamentally for a smoke alarm to be detected 
what are we going to do? So not all smoke alarms sound the same. And here's some hypothetical examples based on what we see in real smoke alarms. Um, there's a wide diversity of different sounds which cross manufacturers and models. It's virtually impossible to know a pattern to know a pattern the smoke alarm will emit before actually sounding it. Which of these corresponds to a correct detection? Is it just one beep, like uh, effectively um, one of these little gaps here, or is it this uh, triple beep here? Uh, we've got a four beep here. So we, is it three or is it four? Um, and uh, how much of this do we need to see? So we could say we start on this line here, um, and then, but do we, does the smoke alarm actually exist as a detection at, at this point? Uh, or is it here? Or maybe it's here. Um, and when should we inform the user? When are they going to want to know? So how many smoke alarms do you think you need? Um, well, the use case tells us where we want the product to work. So we need at least a sample from the geographical regions where the product will work. We also should consider if regional regulations will impact. For example, do kiddie smoke alarms sound the same as in the US as they do are the same products sold in the US and the UK? You can't always tell from what they look like. Um, and here's just a selection of the ones we have. Um, yeah, we bought lots of them. Um, some of them we bought all the most popular ones in the US and all the one, most popular ones in the UK. Um, and now we have hundreds of them. So I don't know if you can imagine what it's like when we have a low battery, um, it, but it's quite difficult. So moving on, we said we're going to use it in a home. So where are we going to use it in the home? So there's a question about where will we integrate this detector? Where's it going to live? Um, so there are a number of places we could put it. So we could put it as a smart camera or a security camera of some sort. Uh, it could be a smart speaker. It could be a thermostat, a smart bulb, a microwave, or a set-top box. And given where these places, are, where these items are going to live in this home, we can make some decisions about how, what kind of distance we would need to be able to detect from. It will inform what kind of data will need to be collected and from where. Um, with audio, you have interesting problems when you put something on a wall, you get various kinds of effects in the room. Um, I don't want to go too much into that detail, um, but essentially audio changes where you view it from um, for, for reasons to do with the physics of audio. Um, so you need to consider where you're going to actually observe the sound from, therefore, you, and you need to collect data from that location. Well, I mentioned that audio quality varies between different types of units and also different types of devices and different units as well, obviously, as their location. Um, and this can lead to challenges where data collected on one device does not match the quality of another device. For, in order to, to help us out with this, we've, we've actually recruited um, a uh, global network of volunteers to feed us data for use in the construction of sound recognition models. And we also have our own facilities for collecting sound um, in an anechoic uh, setting. So that's free of, of reverberation and so-called room effects. It's effectively a very pure sound. I noticed there's a, a couple of questions come up, John Marco. Do, do we want to address those now? Uh, yes. I mean, let me... Okay. The first question was interesting and behind the smoke alarms. So uh, most of the time we have smoke alarms networked so basically already connected to uh, to uh, as an IoT device. So why, for instance, can you give us an example use case where we want to um, detect a smoke alarm? I believe because not all of the smoke alarms are connected to internet, probably. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's essentially, uh, it's a cost question. So um, an internet connected smoke alarm, last time I looked at the nests were about a hundred pounds uh, a unit, um, you can buy a pair of smoke alarms from IKEA for ten pounds. So it's a it's a cost I implication um, that you can deploy more smoke alarms essentially for less money, um, and uh, and still gain the benefit of being kind of connected in a way. So that's that's. I mean, it's not it, obviously it's not the only use case that, um, are of of sound recognition. It's just the reason I chose this one is because it's a nice easy one to understand and i think you know most people know 
what a smoke alarm sounds like and we'll be able to identify them. But yeah, I mean, there's, there's a good question. I mean, if you've got, there are products out uh, in the market that also, um, for example, um, there's a one that's a battery that you replace. It's a Wi-Fi connected battery and it allows you to, it will, um, when the smoke alarm sounds, obviously that starts drawing power and then it can also inform you as well. So, so there are a couple of ways of, of doing connected devices, but the standard sort of connected smoke alarm is, is a quite expensive product in comparison to a normal regular um, smoke alarm. And of course, you may already have smoke alarms installed in your house, which, you know, do you really want to be going and replacing them? Okay. And the second question, I'm sure you can answer, but is, con uh, is about the uh, data set. So can the sound data set with a data set, I, I, I believe is a, a service or website, be seen as a collection of noise, white noise, so through square wave sample? So probably they're asking uh, if we can have a synthetic uh, noise uh, to the data set in order to improve the accuracy in our system. Uh, so, okay, let, let, let me just try and take two questions there because I think I'm, I'm not quite sure exactly which question is being asked, but, but so let me just try and ask, answer two questions and see if I get the right one. In, in the... So, um, uh, it, it, it is possible to um, synthesize audio data. Uh, that's the first thing. I mean, that's, that's what studios do, is synthesize audio data. Um, however, uh, it requires a good deal of care, um, and it requires you to know that the audio, that the synthesis you're making is realistic, because if it's not realistic, you actually haven't gained anything. In fact, you've probably um, made things worse. Um, so you need to validate that the synthesis you're doing is in fact reflective of reality. So if you want to synthesize, say, a smoke alarm with air conditioning at eight meters, then you need to be pretty certain you know what a smoke alarm with air conditioning at eight meters sounds like. So it, 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 can, it can make it possible to extend the data you've got but you kind of need to have quite a bit of data in order to know that what you're doing with that audio is, is realistic. Um, and if the question um, was questioning a slightly different question, which is, is it possible to construct um, specific sounds out of, if you like, more primitive sounds, like essentially doing effectively like a, a reverse Fourier, trans uh, an inverse Fourier transform where you take some kind of signal description that says there's an element of 0.27k and it lasts this long and what have you. Um, again, the answer would be very similar that, that actually you need, need to be careful that you're actually, if you're synthesizing data, you need to be very careful that you're synthesizing the right data. Um, it, is, it is possible um, and we do do it, um, but then we've spent quite a lot of time proving that, that we're doing it right. Um, so uh, we, and we don't use, we, we don't use only synthetic data. We use an awful lot of, of real data. Uh, we'll come up to how much real data in, in, in as well. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Dominic. Uh, so um, at some point, we're going to have to start to consider whether the models that we trained match what we want them to do, what we expect them to do. Um, and the metrics we use to assess the performance are very important. And they're dictated by the use case. So going back to the use case, um, what are you going to do in response to a positive detection in the case of, uh, for example, like a baby cry detection and a smoke alarm? And I'm using this, not, I'm not going to go into baby cry particularly, but I'm using it to consider the very different kinds of responses you can have to such a notification. So for a baby cry detection, we can assume, I think reasonably, that a parent or carer is nearby. They're not going to be far away. Um, for a smoke alarm detection, the homeowner or tenant is likely to be away from the property. If you're there, you, you probably don't need it. You might need it if you're hard of hearing, but, but if you're able-bodied, you, you, you probably wouldn't need it. So the question that, that I like to think about and I like to pose to people is, well, when if someone you're sitting at your desk at the time when you could go into your office and you weren't stuck at home and you receive a notification on your smartphone and it, it says something. So if it's a baby cry, assuming that you're not actually that far away, you are at home, what, what are you gonna do? Well, 
um, I'm a parent of three, so I, I do kind of have a little bit of experience here. Um, so that if you had a baby cry notification, you, you might respond immediately or you might not. You might finish what you're doing, particularly if it's messy or difficult and you don't want to interrupt it. Um, or you might even just leave it and see if the baby will settle again. If you know, for example, that it's teething and therefore, you know, there's not a huge amount you can do. Uh, if you're sat at your desk in your office and the smoke alarm notification comes up on your phone, I think your reaction is going to be pretty dramatic. You're either likely to going to call our neighbor to go and check your home. Uh, you might call a fire service or you might actually just go home yourself, depending on whether that's practical or not. So the reason I raise this is because if you have that baby cry notification come through and it's wrong, you'd be mildly frustrated. If you've raced home from your office thinking your house is on fire, it, it's a very different level of, of cost mentally to deal with that. So the cost of false positives become a critical factor in the acceptance of the system's performance. So for example, supposing we had 90% accuracy uh, at one false positive a day uh, as, as a metric of, of what we wanted to achieve. And that might be perfectly acceptable for use cases uh, and totally useless for others. For baby cry detection, maybe it's good enough. I, I don't know, I'm, I'm just suggesting maybe it is, I don't know. For smoke alarm, one false positive a day, I'd suggest is pretty useless. Um, once a month is beginning to approach usefulness, but I think I'd still be likely to turn it off. When you get down to say one a year, I'm beginning to feel this is likely to be a useful for piece of functionality that I, I'm probably gonna make use for, but I'm still gonna be honest, less will be better. Um, at 90%, if your house is actually burning down, you don't wanna be, in the one in 10 that gets missed. Um, and I say that because I actually had a, well, when I came back from the States, um, uh, we actually had a fire in there. You saw this when the washing machine caught fire. Fortunately, it wasn't serious, but um, it wasn't a very pleasant experience. So for metrics of any sort, it turns out that how you label data can actually increase or decrease your apparent true positive and false positive rate. And we'll come back to labeling as well uh, in a moment. What's important to know is how effective is your metric at reflecting your use case. So whatever you use for whatever domain, be it F score, mean average precision, perplexity, top one, top five, area under curve, it doesn't matter as long as it reflects what you want your product to do. And uh, we have found that the existing metrics to be inadequate for sound recognition and for other disciplines, this may be true as well. Um, and so we designed a, a metric called poly, polyphonic sound detection score to address the problems that we have saw. Uh, and we're going to come back to that again as well in a bit. So um, I call this slide data wrangling. It's actually a series of pieces that, and they're sometimes known as, as different things. Um, essentially, they are the, the following steps, which are effectively data collection in the first instance, then ingestion into some kind of management uh, data labeling and then create data set creation. Um, now, uh, in, in this case, if we imagine uh, we're recording some sound, the sounds of smoke alarms, um, we're presumably going to be in a, a location that is uh, uh, an appropriate location for recording. Um, so let's just say we're in a house. Um, we're going to have one or more smoke alarms we're going to be recording, presumably many. Um, and we want to record from multiple devices. Uh, and we probably want to record from multiple devices at the same time. So, um, so in this case, we've got many microphones recording, multiple event sources, different distances. And, uh, and so, so what we've got is, uh, we've got, in this case, I've just shown two, but in, we imagine, I mean, we have um, situations where we've, we've caught, been recording on more than 50 devices at the same time of the same event. So in this case, we've got two recordings. So they're recording the same, same sequences of, of, of sounds. Um, and uh, we need to obviously do deal with this when we get it uh, you know, back to the lab, so to speak. So the first thing we need to do for audio is we need to say, so here we've got um, a gap. Um, this is probably why people were moving around, moving stuff, talking, what have you. We don't need it. It's not important for uh, the machine learning side of things. So we need to cut the files up into pieces. So we're now going to cut them and then this is a process we call slicing where we take the original recordings and we chop them and leave ourselves with the bits that we need. Uh, once we've sliced them, 
we then go to label them. Now you notice that in this case, I've actually marked what we call fine labeling and episodic labeling. I talked a bit more about this in a previous tiny email talk. So if you go to the YouTube video, you can, you can see a bit more about this, but um, essentially fine labeling is just marking the beats and the episodic is marking the whole sound burst, if you like, which we could, which we would describe as an episode. It's a thing that counts as a smoke alarm sounding. Um, and if you see that, it's smoke alarm sounding. <clears throat> um, and then finally, uh, we'll break them into different data sets. Now, um, after we split the recordings, um, obviously we need to label them uh, and we need to check labels and all sorts of things. Um, there are several steps in this that are inherently manual. Um, making the recordings in the first place, starting and stopping them. Um, that's why we've got these looms of devices so we can record the same event from many different devices, devices concurrently to make that less onerous. Um, triggering the alarms. Um, well, triggering smoke alarms sounds like it ought to be easy, but it actually is not quite as easy as you think. Um, the test signal may not be the sound that it actually, because the test signal is there to check the battery. It's not there to sound the smoke alarm. So it may not be adequate to actually sound a smoke alarm that way. You may need to use, a, you can get um, uh, a special set of, uh, a special um, aerosol kind of thing that actually simulates smoke and, that, and that's what you can use to trigger a smoke alarm. Uh, obviously there's labeling and then there's checking the labels and then making the data splits. Um, we've also discovered um, that uh, there are relevant standards for smoke alarms, as you might expect, they're called T3 and T4. But in fact, a lot of smoke alarms don't actually fully emit, implement exactly what T3 and T4 would say. So you can't just use the T3, T4 specs and go, well, that, that will be enough because um, quite a lot of smoke alarms actually don't, don't quite do what it, it says they're gonna do. Uh, and traceability is necessary for this uh, process. Traceability is, is hugely important because uh, if it's later found that one of the source recordings has some kind of problem or one of the inter intermediate steps has gone wrong, you need to know how to go far, how far you need to go back to undo the work. And also with uh, greater emphasis on privacy, if you're using making recordings in someone's house, you also need to know where they've come from. Um, and, it's in, as, and it's the case in the labeling approach used will be driven by the, the use case. And, uh, you know, as if that wasn't all enough, you also need to consider what happens with errors. Um, these can come from a variety of areas. We've had faulty data collection equipment producing useless or damaged um, recordings, uh, bugs in tools that uh, incorrectly process valid data or silently succeed on, on data that's basically in garbage. Um, errors in labeling, which is not something that's necessarily uh, something you can work around, but, you know, someone just labels something wrongly. Um, and um, labeling tool failures, I, where you label it correctly, but for some reason, something gets saved wrongly. And to deal with these strict checking and tools to fail by default is essential to avoid troublesome data entering the pipeline. Uh, and, and you also need to be able to use um, traceability for things like GDPR. Data versioning is also an important element um, to make sure that when you're comparing different models, you uh, can at least compare the same thing um, subject to uh, any things that might have to be pulled out because of GDPR. Uh, and yeah, I'm not a lawyer, so I'm not going to talk about GDPR, but it's just a thing you need to be aware of and deal with. Uh, we've developed a range of tools for simplifying data collection at scale. I mentioned that. We enforce traceability, we protect privacy, um, and we've hardened our tools to deal with the things going wrong. So now we've got some data, we've got some data sets. Now we can do machine learning because we've got some data. So we're gonna feed some data in, uh, we're gonna turn our pipeline and we're gonna get out some, some, uh, some models. Um, we have a, a proprietary um, network structure, uh, a network topology we used uh, called auditory net, which we use to feed in. We also have found that um, we don't entirely, uh, or we've found that, that models that seem to do well in evaluation can sometimes then start to not perform well when they're put in the real world. And so we've, we've actually designed a specific loss function for doing training to assist in terms of picking out those um, uh, models that work well. Um, we also have um, 
picking up on the question that was asked earlier, we have uh, some some um, innovations like acoustically smart temporal augmentation. So that's basically an element of synthesis of data. Um, and, and we'll typically train a collection of models uh, leading to several candidates, which warrant further evaluation. Um, and I mentioned that we found that the real world sometimes means these don't perform as well as they looked like when we actually originally trained them. So we're gonna get onto real world evaluation. Um, for real world evaluation, you need a lot of real world data. Uh, and what we do is we've collected uh, a large data set. Um, so we're talking um, uh, in the region of 30 million labeled sound recordings across 1000 classes and 400 million metadata points. Um, and from this, we, we can draw a test data set. Your metric for an evaluation needs to be one that accurately reflects the task the model is undertaking. In our case, existing metrics fail to match real world experience. So we introduced a um, polyphonic sound detection score. Um, it was a new metric we introduced last year and it was um, adopted by DCASE 2020 for task four. It was the, DCASE is the primary academic workshop for audio recognition tasks. The evaluation, the metric used can actually lead to significant differences in the understanding of performance. In the case of sound, uh, using polyphonic sound detection score over other more traditionally used score metrics can result in differences of up to 40% in terms of true positive and false positive analysis. And the use case determines what environment the system will operate in. So we need to use data captured in those environments. So I said about in outdoor, you don't need outdoor data, particularly for smoke alarms, but maybe it'd be a good idea to throw a bit at it. Um, so what we do is we take this um, Alexandria, our large data library of these 30 million labeled album recordings. And uh, what we do is we build from that something called the product reporting set, which is a, a set of data that reflects what the use case is going to be experienced to. Uh, once we have candidate models, we then run them through this uh, PRS model, the PRS data set, sorry, the, the product reporting set. Uh, and this reveals where uh, models uh, are going to produce wrong answers. And uh, once we have the errors where the uh, models are producing wrong answers, we have to go and look at why they had errors. And if um, the data proves to be inadequate, we need to go and click more data, or maybe there's some bad, bad data that we need to remove, or maybe they are labeling errors, and so they need correcting. So, this point is really important that actually it can send you all the way back almost to square one of collecting data again if if some errors are encountered um, unfortunately it's not a nice little pipeline that goes in one direction it's a more of a loop um, and as i said the false positives um, can be worse in some cases than others and to give another example of this if an image recognition model misclassifies a lion as a cat most people accept it as an acceptable but silly error but if it classifies it as a motorbike, users are much less find, likely to find it acceptable. So we now have a model that can be trained to, and to be deployed onto devices. Um, of course, the runtime must be able to deliver on the latency requirements for the model. Um, typically for time series data, this means uh, within the interval between new data arriving to the model. Um, you, you can do it in batches, but it usually that would usually require you to overlap batches. Um, so you actually end up doing more work. Um, in any case, it's still wise to do some real world testing on a product, obviously, just like you would do a software product before you deploy and declaring it releasable. And like with all testing, it's likely the model will fail some tests, but the boundaries for acceptable performance have been laid out by the use case. So it's possible to be more objective about making the release ready decision. To, to try and put context around what this means, and we're going to give, I'm going to give you some numbers for what we found with sound recognition tasks. So um, for, for our models, compared to the iOS accessibility suite, we see 56 times fewer false positives uh, from a model with 1 20th of the number of parameters. And compared to mobile net architecture models, which are commonly used in the embedded ML space, we see 144 times less flops. Now, this comes from a whole range of those pieces from the data from the uh, loss function evaluation metric um, and these lead to a uh, reduction in cost of hardware and increased battery life but most important thing is they lead to a product that works in the real world 
by considering the use case, we can develop products that work in real world cases. And if you're interested in learning a little bit more uh, about how we collect data, my co colleague, uh, Dr. Sasha Kristalich has uh, presented one of the Harvard Tiny ML course lectures on this very topic. So you, that's the URL you can see in the corner for that. And finally, I'd like to, I'd like to close with famous hero of machine learning, Donald, Donald Rumsfeld. He uh, was talking about math, weapons of mass destruction. And he said this, he said, there are no knowns, things that we know we know. And there are, thing, there are known unknowns, things we know we don't know. But there are also unknown unknowns, things we do not know, we do not know. And it seems to me that machine learning is absolutely full of things we don't know, we don't know. Uh, Mike Nixon Bongtoft uh, at of IDEA at the time, which is a design consultancy, came up with this matrix of possibilities. There's stuff we know that we know, and we call those assumptions. The stuff we know that we don't know, and we call those gaps, and they often give us the sleepless nights because that's the stuff we know we really need to find out about. The stuff we don't know we know that we actually do know, and he called this tacit knowledge. I tend to think of this as uh, jungle knowledge or tribal knowledge that these typical in software houses where someone arrives new and doesn't get told the thing that everyone knows. And then the final corner is the discoveries. This is where the stuff we don't know, we don't know. And I think the discoveries are the things that make ML performance in TinyML really interesting. Um, and they can genuinely make TinyML better and offer up huge opportunities for TinyML to become really pervasive across trillions of devices across the world. Uh, so I'll take some questions now, Jamaka. Yes, Dominic, thank you very much for your presentation. It was really, really interesting. I also have a question for you. Before going to the questions, I'd like just to send the polls to the attendees and mm -hmm. we continue with the, all the questions. So, okay. Okay, so that's the first question is, these let me check it so i digested the questions because it was pretty long but in short how can you guarantee your sensor will be better than human uh, at understanding which alarm actually went off so to give you an overview about this question so the the, the person is asking if you have different sensors in different buildings how, how, how can you discriminate which one is, uh, is sounding? Um, it's, it's not something that, that we, so we don't do location uh, or, or locating the sound. We, it, it's possible to do it. It's just not been something that we've done. You use time of flight essentially to, to do location essentially. Um, but but um, in our case, if you think about smoke alarms sounding in a house, you may get multiple smoke alarms sounding at the same time. So um, positioning is perhaps not so useful uh, in that context. Okay. And um, another question is, um, do you do some local training like calibration to understand how the sun behaves where the sensor was installed? Um, do we do something like calibration? Um, we do have uh, techniques to allow us to um, adjust uh, the behavior of a system. The, my, my colleague Jardash uh, Bilen produced a, a, a blog post on post biasing uh, as just that, that would be a good place to start looking at that. So yes, um, post biasing is is a is a technique we've 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 deployed for for that purpose. Okay, so there is also yeah a consideration about one slide. So ba basically, false detection is almost as bad as misdetection, as the false detection will desensitize us to appreciating the validity of the detection. Can you elaborate or get what 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 you think about it? Um, you're, you're right. I mean, uh, in the case of smoke alarm, your house burning down, both errors are bad. Um, uh, so, it, so the answer is, I, I'm not sure I, I'd want to choose which, which error. Well, I think if I'm going to choose, if I'm going to choose a mistake to make, I'd rather have a false positive than a misdetection. Um, but again, it, it depends on uh, that. That's why it depends on the use case, because for a baby cry, um, you would take a different view. 
So it depends on, on, on the application and what you're trying to, what the product is trying to do to know which way you want to treat false positives. For, for those sort of security things like smoke alarms, glass breaks, those kinds of things, burglar alarms, you, you probably err on the side of reporting false positives over um, misdetections, but you still need a low number of false, false positives. That, that's what I was trying to get across with that is that the false positives uh, still need to be low because otherwise people will just disable it. Okay, so the next question is, a question in consideration at the same time, I would say, uh, is about if you could, let's say, change the sound of the smoke detector, would you hit it? Could it make the life easier for us for training it? I mean, changing directly the sound. Uh, yeah. So uh, I didn't. I didn't talk about augmentation. I'll, I'll. I'll just whiz up one slide if you don't mind. I did have this slide. I. I wasn't going to show it necessarily, um, but I will show it. So this is our facility for recording sound. So this is uh, the, the. The picture on the left is a semi anechoic space. So that means it has a a very very low reverb time, and the one on the right is a completely anechoic space. So this is a large, the one on the left is a large space. It's where we smash windows and we get very, very pure recordings. They've got no room effects, no reverberation. So then, yeah, we can, we can mix in, in those with uh, uh, other sounds. And, and we can also, in the case of, um, uh, for example, the smoke alarm, yeah, you, you can do things like pitch shifting and, th and things like that as augmentation techniques, just to sort of give the model a bit more to deal with. Okay. So the next question is, how many episodes are typically used to train a model for smoke detection? Sorry, how many? Uh, episodes. Or, episodes. Um, I, yeah. I, I, I'm going I'm to skirt that one because I don't actually know, quite frankly, because okay. I, I don't do machine, I don't do training. I actually work on the inference engine side. So I'm, I'm afraid I can't answer that. Um, yeah, I'm sorry. Okay, no problem. Uh, do, 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 do. Yes, mm, I had a question. I, this is my question. In, in terms of time spent in percentages, how much time is spent on generating a good data set? And how much time is spent on generating a good model in percentages, more or less? Um. It's, it's a really, really good question, Gianmarco, and the answer is I can't give you a precise answer, but I will give you an answer, which I think will, 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 give, will satisfy your, your question. I think it's fair to say um, we have as many people working in data as we do in training models, if not more. Um, so that, that's the first part of the question. The second part goes back to what I said about errors and um, what we've tended to find is that as we start to train a model, we start to understand the data we need better. And so we then go up and get more data, uh, a better data or change how we, you know, we've discovered that we've mislabeled data. We've discovered we need to label it differently because the way we labeled it originally, which seemed reasonable, turns out not to be ideal. Um, I'd guess, and it is a big guess, it's something like 60, 40, but it's hard, I say it's hard to break down 60% data collection, 40% training, but I say it's hard to, hard to determine because of the fact that it's related to, um, uh, as we discover more, we, we, we adapt what we do. Okay. Thanks, Dominic, for your answer. Um, I have other, um, another question. So have you looked into online adaptation to changing environments? Or more generally, I'll be curious to hear if you have any comments on that. Um, I am I'm, I'm just, just making sure I understand the question here and I'll answer the question I think is being asked. So can we adapt how the model behaves in situ based on what we see? Um, the answer is uh, we can, we don't at the moment. Um, we have done in the past. Um, we went away from it um, because uh, we found that um, certain things that we wanted to be able to do uh, became more difficult. For example, if you adapt online, um, testing becomes quite challenging because 
your mod your system starts to adapt to things that are happening around it um, and it can make testing quite difficult particularly if you want to use the same data um, and we also found that uh, it just generally rerunning things and revalidating stuff particularly during uh, you know earlier stages it, it caused some issues so it's not something we do at the moment we may come back to it in due course but um, we have found it in the past to, to, to be um, not a universally satisfactory answer to the problem. Okay. Thanks so much, Dominic. I think we can proceed with the next slide. Okay. Um, before going with the next slides, I uh, just to make an announcement because I don't think we have a slide for that. But the announcement is for the Tanya Mel EMEA. So the a Europe, Middle East, um, Asia, and uh, Africa, the tech forum that is planned to take place in June, this uh, 7 um, and to the 10th, or sorry, from the 7th to the 10th of June. Uh, the event will be hosted uh, online, uh, given the COVID situation. Uh, but yes, we really look forward to uh, meeting or having this uh, tech forum uh, in person. Uh, so I think we can proceed with this slide. So once again, I'd like to thank uh, all the uh, Tiny ML Tech uh, Talk sponsors uh, that you can find here um, on this uh, on this slide. Um, so I think yes, we have uh, one slide for each one. We have a slide for ARM, the company I'm working uh, for. Um, ARM for the tiny ML space is providing the SIM and library, uh, which is a low level library with uh, optimized routine for the most common uh, operators for uh, convolution networks. Um, concerning the other, the other companies, we have Deploy. Uh, we use AI to make other AI faster, so small and more power efficient. And so on this slide, basically, there is a summary of what they, uh, what, what, what Deep, Deep Light uh, does. Um, also, uh, there is uh, Edge Impulse, um, which basically the tiny ML for all developers uh, from data search to the, to the test. So here is reported um, some of the uh, key aspect behind the, um, the Edge Impulse uh, company. Also, we have the Maxim integrated, uh, Maxim integrated uh, with sensors and signal conditioning, uh, low power Cortex M4 and advanced AI acceler um, acceleration. Uh, Quixo with the auto machine learning for embedded AI, uh, an, automat an automated machine learning platform that builds TinyML. Uh, solution for the edge using uh, sensor data. Uh, also in this case, as before, there are quite a lot of interesting information that you can also um, you can also uh, see. Uh, Reality AI, which is is for building products in the in the area of artificial intelligence. And so the um, tools uh, mentioned on the right hand side of this slide, like automated feature exploration and model generation. Uh, or, or automated data assessments. And in the end, we have SimSense. So that builds ultra low power, uh, with low total power, we mean sub millivolt, millivolt uh, sensing and inference hardware for embedded devices. I think we have, yes, completed the, 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 um, the the sponsor of the Tanya Math Talks. Uh, but before leaving, I'd like just to announce the next Tanya Math Talks, the one already mentioned before uh, um, on the 2nd of March. Uh, Eben Upton, the founder of the Raspberry Pi Foundation, is going to talk about the inference with Raspberry Pi Pico. On our side for the Tiny ML UK meetup, so the next one, the fourth, will be the uh, 20th of April. Uh, we're gonna have a presentation in the in the area of our Arduino. So we're gonna explore the Arduino solution for Tiny ML. Okay, and that's it. I think we have finished for today. Um, so um, I, I don't know. There is another question. I don't know if you want to take now. Is um, 
I think we can answer this quick question. Um, can you adopt online to, oh, sorry, can, how much time does the real life test take? Um, it's a good question. Um, the answer is often driven by how long do you have, but um, the answer is quite a long time. Um, we have arranged um, test loops, for example, that run overnight and things like that. So, um, but but it's it's usually going to be quite a long time. You can only play back audio at the speed playback playing back audio can happen. Um, and and we typically also deploy devices if possible to people's homes for weekends and things like that. So we get you know a reasonably good length of time when we wouldn't be expecting to see anything. Okay, so thanks a lot, Dominic. Uh, yes, I think we have finished for today. Of course, as a reminder, you can use our tiny ML page to ask your questions for this talk, but also other generic questions on tiny ML. Uh, so really look forward to see uh, to see your your questions also on on our uh, on our page. I think with this, I'd like to um, to say. Thank you very much, Dominic, uh, for your presentation once again. It was really a pleasure, um, uh, I mean, listening to your talk, interesting. And we had also, we had quite a lot of interesting questions as well. And also thank you all of you for attending this, uh, this presentation. And with this, see you at the, our next Daniel Meetup, which is gonna be the 20th of April. Bye-bye.